Welcome, everybody, to episode 25. It's a quarter of the way there to 100. And after 100, we'll do 101. Well, it's good to see you again. I did a workshop at Mike Boyle's this weekend, and as I was doing it, I had a really interesting insight about what I call Coaching 101, and I'll go through those three principles uh, right now. But what was interesting is that one of my foundational coaching principles, uh, I usually count it as number two, I'm starting to think of it, you need to do it number one. And that's, of course, you got to invest wisely in asymmetrical risks. I got thinking, most of the stuff I teach, um, especially when I work with adult populations, is a kind of, I worry about things. For example, uh, I, I say this all the time, you, you should have a bicycle that can get you about 90 miles away. Uh, it doesn't have to be a triathlon bike, it can be a cruiser like I have, something that can get you out of a dangerous situation. Uh, I, I learned this uh, when we were preparing for the 2002 Olympics here in Salt Lake, I was on several committees and of course, you know, we just had 9-11 and we were very concerned something bad would happen. And it was nice to go to these emergency preparedness workshops because what it did for me, and it continues today, is it got me to start thinking instead of worrying about these things that could happen, you say, oh, this thing could happen. Well, what's a simple step to take? Uh, which brings us to point number two, embrace the obvious. If you have to be able to go from here to 90 miles away without a car because all the overpasses will, could crush, uh, get yourself a reliable bicycle. Um, I have a little backpack right there that has four days supply of food and water for four people. It's right there. I just put that on my back and we go. Um, when you coach, a really important thing to do I wouldn't suggest doing it to your team 10 seconds before the game starts, but early in the week, you as a staff sit down and say, what's the worst that can happen? And someone always says, we can lose the game. All right, you follow that along. Well, if it's a preseason game and you lose it, and you're in a championship format, it doesn't matter at all. If it's a friendly game, it doesn't even matter a little bit. What's the worst that can happen is, you know, you get an injury or two. Now, you can't prevent that. But what you do is you have this conversation about uh, the asymmetrical risks. And sometimes you can do things very early as a coach to take care of these things. And usually it brings us to point number two, which is embrace the obvious. Um, <laughs> I with the football coach who showed up to a football game without any footballs. Well... We fix that from now on by having a list, and it was the backup quarterback's job to make sure the balls were there. Uh, the starting quarterback, his own list of things he needed to make sure. And as a, as we we started making these checklists, pretty soon it, we you looked at this checklist and every single thing was obvious. And of course, my coaching philosophy is embrace the obvious. Runners run, sprinters sprint, hurdlers hurdle, hurdle, swimmers swim. Jumpers jump, throwers throw. If you want to get stronger, lift weights. Uh, if you want to lose uh, fat, you might want to cut your calories a little bit. It's all obvious. You're thirsty, drink water. Well, this is coffee, but you get the point. And of course, the third point in my coaching is real simple. I don't look very much at results anymore. I just look at the process. If you embrace the obvious and you, you keep doing that over and over and over, magically, the results happen, you steer the results in a direction that's what you want. Um, it's not very sexy and it's not very, uh, I mean, I don't think too many of our listeners are now at the edge of their seat going, wow, I'm going to go do the obvious, you know, but it is the way you want to get things done. Um, we will be putting this together in a series of workshops here at Dan John University but it's gonna take me some time. Uh, I have a great vision of where we're heading on a 10-part video series with follow-up tests and other materials to kind of show you this system. At first, we're thinking of calling it the art of coaching, but it's just uh, this is just kind of a hint of what we wanna do. All right, thank you. Let's get into this week's questions. Question number one comes from Joe. That's a nice name. 
Joe, I am 38 years old and I've been working as a coach for eight years. I feel like my journey is still just beginning. And you know, Joe, I'm going to tell you, that's the, I can't think of a better way to talk about coaching is that you still think like you're just starting because it's, it's, it's odd, but either every new year or every new season, everything, everything old becomes new again. Having listened to your wisdom in book and audio form for all those years, I wonder what was Dan John like when he was a 38 year old? Have you changed much in your approach or how you work with people? So I thought about this, Joe. Um, Math-wise, that puts us back to 1996, uh, 97, maybe it's in that in that ballpark. Okay. Um, so one thing I, when I was thinking about this in 1996 was probably the greatest year of coaching I had. Well, that's not fair, but so that was the year Paul Northway uh, graduated from uh, Judge Memorial. He threw the discus 214 feet nine and a half inches. Uh, we had Division I coaches from all over the country come to this little backwater Catholic high school in Salt Lake City to find out what we were doing. Our workouts were one hour a day. Um, but, Joe, the reason all this happened was because 1996 also means that I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old in the house. 1996 also means that I'm working a full-time job at, uh, at, at Judge Memorial but I'm also teaching at the time English as a second language at nights because we, you know, we're struggling financially. But another thing that's going on in 1996, uh, Joe, is the fact that I've started my another master's degree, which is taking up about two hours of reading every night and three hours on Sunday for this in kind of this intentional community meeting we had to have. Um, I had no time. I had no... Uh, I didn't have a lot of energy, so what I did was, and if you read my work, you, you know, um, well, <laughs> I, I looked at it and I said, you know, how can we collapse everything? How can we get things done more efficiently, quicker, faster, smarter? And this started us, so this is when we were circuit training our, our throwing workouts. We would have five stations. Uh, this is when we did the transformation program in the weight room. Three sets of eight of two exercises with a minute rest. Literally nine and ten minute weight workouts. So when I look back on those times, it makes me actually kind of energized. And that's why I like your question so much. Uh, one of the things that the biggest change that I didn't have at the time are two tools the easy strength tool, which have been marvelous to have in the off season, and of course the loaded carries. But right there at 38, because of my busy schedule, it allowed me to be a better coach because I started using this more than just this. Okay, we have a follow-up to this, Joe. To Joe. As a huge fan of the likes of Tolkien and Star Wars, and no knowing that you are more than a little familiar with this material, for fun, I was wondering what you think the biggest coaching takeaway is from the Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, as these are filled with great teachers such as Gandalf, Yoda, and Obi-Wan. Well, uh, very simple. I got two quick answers for you. Uh, the first is the importance of the mentor, somebody who's been there before. You know, I can remember sitting at lunch one day. We were just sitting at lunch, and Bill Witt and I were sitting there. And the world record holder in the hammer was there, Yuri Sadiq. John Powell, who had the world record in the discus. And Brian Oldfield, who had been the world record holder in the shot put. And Bill and I were sitting there, and I think Ben Tuma might have been there too. And what we were just doing is talking about what makes an athlete elite. And I can remember talking with Bill later on about what a wonderful opportunity we missed for a, for a movie right there because these guys were dripping wisdom upon us. Um, these guys had all been there before. These guys had all gone down that dark cave before. These guys had all dived into that underground lake. And they were, and I think that the, the thing that I get most out of these books is, for example, Obi-Wan, and we don't know it in the first, which I think is still the first two of the best two of the Star Wars, 
Um, Obi-Wan has been there, done that. And so when he's trying to help Luke Skywalker as a mentor, one of the things Luke is doing, as all people early on the uh, journey do, he's pushing back on Yoda. He's pushing back on Obi-Wan the whole time. But they'd been there, and he hadn't yet. And of course, the second thing, and I've already alluded to it, is the journey. Um, uh, that's I do like the work of Joseph Campbell very much, although obviously some people have just abused and destroyed his vision with their own nonsense, but we'll stop there. Um, but the, the one thing is, you know, and it, there's a thousand ways to say it, the, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step and all that, but folks, it's going to be a journey. Uh, you got to walk the walk. One of my favorite scripture verses is Luke 24. Um, it's the journey to Emmaus. And these two people are walking down the street. I've always liked to think of them as a married couple. Uh, and all of a sudden this person comes and starts arguing with them, telling them all these things. And they walk the seven miles to Emmaus. Uh, if I'd ever tell you the secret to coaching, it'd be two words. Walk with. You walk with your athletes. Um, you can point the direction, you can tell them what's coming up, but you got to walk with them. Interesting how those two questions, working with Paul Northway and that whole group, uh, all the Knicks and Lauren, it was a wonderful time in my career. But that particular 96 season was when I was still throwing the discus, exhausted constantly from parenting, all the extra jobs, uh, all the extra stress going on. My athletes walked with me and I walked with them. I was their mentor, but we were companions on the journey. Boy, I gotta tell you, Joe, you, you win question of the day so far. But let's see if Henry can outdo you, okay? Do you have any training recommendations for people that enjoy doing CrossFit? I'm gonna ask Brian to start putting bourbon in my coffee mug for these kinds of questions. I appreciate that. Yeah, do CrossFit. Uh, do you have any re training recommendations for people who, that enjoy swimming? Swim, bicycling, bicycle, snowshoeing, snowshoe. But let's keep going. How would how would you, I guess, incorporate carries, Maffy tone work, and some of the other things you recommend? Well, the first thing I'd say is right now, Henry, um, exactly how many rabbits would you like to chase in this example? CrossFit. So you got CrossFit over here, which is on one extreme, and then you got Phil Maffetone's work, which is, I, I would put Phil with, uh, oh, uh, certainly uh, one of the more reasonable people in the history of our field. Uh, I would throw in Steve Ilg with that too. Um, very reasonable uh, uh, people. So uh, you got some extremes here. Um, loaded carries, I, it should be part of any normal training program. But the, the one thing I, I do would, would recommend from just hearing this is I don't hear level changes in this question. Um, and it, it, level changes is more than just jumping up and down and burpees. But one of the things I, one of the things I see missing in CrossFit um, is that there's a lot of work, but there's not a lot of combination work. Like, uh, like my favorite is goblet squat, prowler, push-up, followed by goblet squat, prowler, push-up. Today's workout, which I'll be heading out to in about three hours, uh, a huge bit, a part of it is I let, I'll be laying on the ground, I'll jump up and sprint, reverse sled pull, bear crawl, and I'll repeat that. Um, level is going from standing to the ground to the jump. Um, so on the ground, you would have prone on your back. Um, on the ground, you'd have six point. Uh, you'd have the bear position, which is just your hands and feet on the ground, your knees are elevated. Um, uh, you, there's, I call it air, but being in the air, hanging, brachiating, um, squat, hinge, loaded carry, those are all those different levels. And I think it's my job as a, as, as a coach to, to, to make you have level changes. Uh, this is a tough question for me to answer, uh, Henry. Uh, on paper, uh, CrossFit should be perfect, so um, I don't know if I... Uh, the enemy of good, though, is perfect, so um, 
We'll just see. I, I hope I answered your question. It, it's a difficult one for me personally. We have a question from Jeff. Jeff asks, what type of leg training would you recommend to improve explosiveness quickness when you want to avoid gaining any more mass in the legs? When I do heavy squats and deadlifts, my legs get huge and I don't see explosiveness I was hoping to see. Um, we have a real issue here right away, Jeff. Um, quickness especially is very specific. Um, when I say, when someone's quick on a football field, it's radically different than what you would see as quickness uh, in handball or racquetball uh, or, even, or even tennis. So I've always thought that agility and quickness are a lot more specific than maybe other people would argue. I've never been a real believer that you can uh, generally in, improve quickness. Uh, certainly, it, it, with the right toolkit, we can help you be quicker. But so much of quickness... <laughs> I used to coach defensive backs. <laughs> this is I sh should have thought of this right away. But I used to co coach defensive backs. And I would tell them that your eyes are faster than your feet. So when they break the huddle, if you're looking in and, and, and a very, very wide vision... If you're looking for clues uh, when they break and you're and you're paying attention, for example, the guy who jogged out of the huddle eight straight plays is now sprinting up to the line of scrimmage with a big smile on his face. To me, that's a clue that it might be going to him. So, and as they line up and you, uh, we, we number uh, uh, offensive receivers as one, one is the widest, two, and then three, and we have a phrase, one can hurt you, two can kill you. So use your eyes. If one goes inside, use your eyes to pick up two. Why am I saying this? Because it'll look like I'm quickly reacting with my feet, and I'm not making any false steps, but I'm using my eyes for quickness. Uh, I have some equipment here at the home. Uh, we have this device that uh, flickers your eyesight and changes your eyesight and uh, in various ways. Um, I think something like that can improve your quickness because it makes your eyes work harder. I take that lacrosse ball and I stick it under the neck like this and I and I force you to have the startle reflex. But when you bite down like this, you, you, you physically get startled and it, it ruins it. I believe that those kind of things improve. So eyesight improves quickness. Knowing what to do uh, and trusting everybody else increases quickness. Mm -hmm. Now, on explosiveness, uh, I've got a one I got a one word answer for you, and that's sprint. I think sprinting is the key. Uh, if you can get yourself to a high school track or a college track, and you know, I would even pay the coach uh, if they can set up a speed trap for you, so you come into the speed trap at top speed and maybe they measure you for 10 meters or 20 meters and you just try to improve your time over a couple of weeks, that's going to really be what explosiveness is. Now, you can certainly do it by measuring things like the standing long jump and checking for improvement, but speed trap sprinting, uh, and this comes from Mike Boyle, Barry Ross, Charlie Francis, uh, a whole bunch of uh, Division I uh, strength coaches, that seems to be a, a, a superior way to not only test your explosiveness, but to improve it. Because if you're running 20 meters in <laughs> three, three seconds, uh, actually, that was terrible. Uh, as you slide down from three to two nine to two eight, all your other explosiveness qualities are going to be improving too. Um, interesting question. Thank you. We have a question here from Anthony. Anthony's uh, in the middle of a very, uh, a very interesting process here. I'm currently in the middle of losing weight, 35 pounds down. Salute, Anthony. Good job. Good job. Uh, and his, his, he says 50-ish to go. Well, that's, that's, that's a lot of weight. Good luck on this. And found your podcast extremely useful. Uh, yeah, listening to me makes you not want to eat. Yes, that, that seems to help a lot. 
Um, I've been told by many women that I'm very good for their dieting by looking at my face. Um, I am fairly strong, but pretty overweight. Um, cut one quick thing, just real quick. A lot of my materials, for example, uh, if you look up the stony work, the stony exercises, S T O N E Y. And some of the other materials like, uh, this is, these are, uh, overweight training ideas. Okay. I recently tried doing ab rolls, ab rollouts with a barbell and was able to squeeze out four sets of four. Is it better to do a small amount of rollouts or do a different exercise until I lose more weight and can train the rollouts at a higher rep count? Well, the problem with the bar, what well, load is always the issue with the uh, rollout. And when you, because you have friction on the ground with the barbell, it's going to be hard for, uh, if you were to do those ab rollouts on asphalt, it would be really hard to get any done. If you do, do those on a real uh, hard mat, it'll be a lot easier if you fall. If you do it on like a, a prowler on wet grass would be probably pretty easy. But an ab rollout with a barbell on wet grass would probably be really hard. Um, one of the things I want you to think about. Uh, so the answer is, I think four sets of four is fine. I'd even slide back to two sets of five and just make sure you keep doing them. Don't push the ab roll out too much. I don't want you to get, you can, you might be able to damage. And I, I think a lot of my friends who grew up, uh, uh, we used to com compete on the ab wheel. Uh, I think it actually left us with some umbilical hernia uh, issues. Um, the, the one thing I'd like you to start thinking about, Anthony, is as you lose mass, your walking is going to get easier and easier and easier. As you lose mass, all your body weight stuff is going to get easier and easier and easier. So this is like a warning to you. When you are 85 pounds heavier, going for a walk was a loaded carry. One thing I'd like you to think about is if you find things like walking and body weight work is getting easier and easier and easier, I would like you to start thinking uh, of adding load to that. So you're 35 pounds down. When you go for a walk now, if you throw a 16K kettlebell, 35 pounds, in your backpack, it's going to bring you back to the load that you had a few months or weeks ago, whatever it was. So that would just be an idea that I'd like you to think about. Anthony, if you want to discuss this more, uh, re-email us, re us and we'll, we'll answer more questions. Daniel. Daniel, what a beautiful name. Uh, do you have any uh, alternatives to the power clean for developing explosiveness since I'm unfamiliar with the movement and I don't have access to a coach that can help me? Um, there's a piece of equipment that actually works well. Uh, I personally don't do this because we do we do the Olympic lifts and we do the kettlebell world. But this trap bar jump with lighter loads, uh, Mike Boyle sings praises to these. And I've had a lot of high school coaches on this one forum that I go to. It's a Facebook forum for strength coaches. And they really are excited about the trap bar jump with lighter loads. Um, you, you want it. We used to call these East German poles, and I don't know why. I Maybe some East German invented it. But when you're doing the Olympic lifts, uh, the high pulls for training, you can pull it all the way up as high as you can, which we used to call Holbrook pulls from Phil Holbrook. Or you pull them to about here, which was a standard pull. Or you just keep your arms straight, and you do kind of a snatch grip or clean grip explosive deadlift. Well... On these trap bar jumps, you're going to keep your arms straight. You're going to hinge off the ground, accelerate, get yourself at least at least to tippy toes, and probably a little bit of air would be fine too. Uh, take your time building up to it. Make sure you're catching the weight appropriately. Uh, so after you land, don't have locked knees, you know, and practice it. Practice it a session or two before you start thinking about load. Uh, Daniel, this question is becoming more and more common because a lot of us are starting, now that the explosive work is becoming so popular in the weight room, a lot of people are now saying, well, 
we want the benefits of the snatch and the clean and jerk, but we don't want to go through the <laughs> the time to teach them correctly. I personally don't like what I just said, but I understand why you would not not want to take the time teaching certain athletes the Olympic lifts. I understand it. Um, this is why it's so important to have a, a, a background of training as you come in to elite performance so you know how to do those things. Daniel, good question. Uh, if you don't have a trap bar, uh, you could do snatch or clean get grip, uh, those uh, East German poles where you explosively finished. This is kind of exciting. So uh, the, the people asking questions are Daniel, David, and then Daniel again. This is going to be a very exciting day for me. As many of you know, one of my names is David. David asks, what are your thoughts on doing the Southwood program with limited rest periods? Um, the Southwood program is based on limited rest periods. Uh, we, were, we worked in four-person cohorts. Uh, it would So person one would clean, followed by two, followed by three, followed by four. When four put the bar down, person one would start again. But this, I think you're thinking about training alone. Say 45 seconds between rounds, and if I succeed with that, do 30 seconds the next time. Yeah, absolutely. I um, Planned rest periods are always a good idea. Um, one of the things I think that's so great about the kettlebell, personally, is that it's, it, it's one of the best density tools that we have in our field. So uh, density is very simply this. Uh, it's one of two things. Either it's the same amount of work in less time. Uh, track and field, basically, the, the running events are density work. Um, if you start off as a 400 meter runner when you're 12, and when you're 22, you run the 400 meters, uh, ideally, it's the same amount of work in less time. So the kettlebell is like running events and track. You want to do the same amount of work in less time. And of course, there's another option floating there, more work in less time, which is, you know, a little different so yeah I'm always a fan of rest periods because I think it's one of the forgotten what you're asking David shrinking rest periods is a kind of a lost gem in what we do um, when peripheral heart action was so po popular back in the day uh, a bodybuilding version of circuit training uh, one of the things it was designed for was to increase definition. More work, more work, less time. And I suppose it was good for definition. That and a zero carbohydrate diet with a little bit of running was very popular in the 60s. And you can see that in John McCallum's book, The Keys to Progress. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think it's a great idea, all right? We have a question from Daniel for non-competitive lifters. Do you think the squat variation of the Olympic lifts are necessary? And he says, as a follow-up, he says, am I missing anything by doing the power variations instead? Well, you know, um, you, I have a shot put friend. Uh, I call him Pizza Steve because I don't remember why I call him Pizza Steve. I worked with him when he was in the eighth grade all the way until he became a national level shot putter uh, when he graduated from college. And Pizza Steve, <laughs> he's now a chiropractor, which makes me laugh. Uh, he realized that uh, he didn't like how his wrists felt doing the Olympic lifts, so he never turned his wrists over. Uh, so his shot put training was all high pulls and it worked really well. Now. One of the reasons I like the squat snatch so much, the Olympic snatch, is it's beautiful. First, it's a beautiful movement, but also it is a an amazing assessment. Uh, when you leap into an overhead squat, you'd better have mobility, flexibility, strength, um, tension, uh, relaxation in every joint muscle in your body. But if you're not if you don't need to use them, I don't think you ha absolutely have to. Uh, you're not gonna, yeah, you're not gonna die. Again, I like them because of. I like to teach them to everybody, 
early in their career, eighth grade, ninth grade, earlier if you can, so that that toolkit is always there. Uh, once someone hits a certain age, I'm not sure there's any value in learning them unless you compete. And the following is follow-up question: Do you like the clean or snatch pull exercise? The answer is yes. And do that uh, variation I talked about just a minute ago, that straight armed, and the arms never bend, East German variation. And then, of course, uh, Brian Oldfield told me one time, the great shot putter, that one of the smartest things he ever did is he found a rack at a gym where the, uh, the bars were this uh, close, and uh, it, it was a, probably an old isometric uh, rack, and he just stuck weights in there and just did these very aggressive rack pulls up to sets of 15, which I think is really high for a thrower. And he said it was probably the best year of, uh, the best off season lifting of his career. Real quick, let me give it, it's only three exercises. Um, partial front squats in the rack, uh, partial pulls in the rack, and partial presses in the rack, two sets of 15 twice a week. And he said it was the best he made the best off-season progress of his career. So yes, Daniel, I like that very much. Andre writes us, My wife is interested in getting into strength training after giving birth to our fourth daughter in November. Well, hats off to you, my friend. I have two girls, and uh, uh, they like to point out which of the gray hairs belongs to them. She is a former college athlete, but she hasn't trained in a few years. I'm encouraging her focus on goblet squats, goat belly sw uh, swings, and burpees. Uh, no, waiting on the kettlebell swing and leading with the goat belly swing as a goat swing, goat bag swing seems to be more mistake proof and drives similar results. Is my thinking correct? Andre asks in a side note. Yes. In fact, honestly, I don't know why you would even have her do the kettlebell swing. You're, you're going to be doing great with the goblet squat in the Bulgarian goat bag swing. Okay, that's the, really, those are the best. And I'd move away from burpees because um, I just think you should move away from, start having to do push-up position planks and evolve up into the push-up. She does not have much time to train. Any other high benefit movements you'd like to have her focus on? Well, yeah, uh, there's a thing called walking. And the nice thing about having four daughters is if the two of you go for a walk, you're going to get a bunch of suitcase carries uh, and uh, uh, by carrying the babies. Um, and unlike carrying a kettlebell or a dumbbell, those squirming little things are going to give you a heck of a workout. Honestly, don't ignore walking. Don't ignore it. One thing I would like you to think about, so um, now beyond that, maybe something like suitcase carries, you know, like I, I've said before that Stu McGill speaks so highly of what the suitcase carry can do for for this part of your body. Um, for those listening, I'm pointing to my column or my core or whatever we're calling it this week. Um, just then, of course, the suitcase carry is a one-handed farmer walk. One thing I would like you to start pushing into, and let's call it the let's call it the mommy uh, or Andrea's wife's uh, burpee. Um, the Bulgarian goat bag swing, set a 10, set a 10 goblet squat on the floor for a push-up position plank, and maybe you can time it, whatever, pop back up, the goat bag swing for nine, goblet squat for nine, uh, do the plank, eight, eight plank, seven, seven plank, six, six plank, and i tell you one thing, it's gonna be the getting up and down off the ground that's gonna give her heart the workout. And it's real simple. It's going to cover everything down the line. Let's get some push-ups in. And, and by the way, Andre, Andre, congratulations. That's that's nice. Nice. That's good to hear. Um, wow. We have another David with a question. I, I think what's happening is people have decided there's only three names in the world now. So we're just going to throw them at us. David says, you mentioned hypertrophy work a lot. Hypertrophy me is the fancy way of saying bodybuilding or attempting to increase lean body mass. Would you expand on what you mean by that? Oh, I just did, okay. <laughs> I'm specifically referring to your comments on the plus 35 crowd. Yeah, after age 35, you need, it's, 
it's odd to say this as a strength coach, but most people train the exact opposite way. In your youth, you should be doing the Olympic lifts and the power lifts. Get yourself as powerful and strong as you'll be and try to hold on to that strength for the rest of your life. But most people now start off by bodybuilding, so they look like they're strong until, you know, you invite them over to your house when you move, or they do a Highland game, or when you invite them over to your house to move. Uh, nothing worse than to see a guy who looks like he's the strongest man in the universe, and he hurts his back picking up a couch. It's just embarrassing. Or, or he can't lift and carry out a box of books. So, but once you hit 35, strange stuff starts to happen. Um, you you just, it, it seems like the universe starts to conspire against you. Uh, there's a funny way some people talk about men's aging, and since we're both men, uh, and it comes in three parts, stud, dud, thud. Uh, you know, means it, it drop into the ground. Well, when you hit the, <laughs> when you hit the dud stage, which is basically 35, yeah, you really have to uh, fight against the body, which is trying to get as fat and soft and stiff as it possibly can. And that's why I recommend uh, combining bodybuilding movements with mobility. So, I mean, if you're going to do something like press, uh, well, okay, if you're going to do uh, overhead press, I like the half kneeling press because that's going to make your, your, your pelvic bowl have to adapt to the load moving vertically. Okay, well, that's going to be mobility work. Well, after that set, I might even have you do a little stretch. So you're doing bodybuilding movement followed by mobility movement, bodybuild mobility, bodybuild mobility. I don't like rest periods uh, when I train uh, adults. I like them constantly either doing an original strength movement or it, between after the set of the lifting exercise, either an original strength movement, especially this one that's on the ground, and then some kind of um, whatever, if you want to call it a stretch or whatever. But you're constantly doing something. Um, it is strange to watch, uh, and, and the research is so clear on this now, as you age, your power drops off. And I'd almost say, uh, it's it's not like the season's changing. It's like a hurricane hitting. Uh, and then, and then the, your lean body mass, of course, uh, goes in the wrong direction. Uh, you you get less powerful, you get fatter, and you get stiffer as you age. I think the toolkit that we offer in the weight room is the answer to so many of these issues. So after 35, start thinking push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. Uh, in the push, pull, and the squat, get those numbers up in the 8 to 12 range and start, you know, start searching for the pump a little bit in those exercises. Thank you. Lisa uh, sends us a note. I'm a 61-year-old woman two years after a total hip replacement. Uh, you should be feeling pretty good now. I've really struggled to get back into a consistent pattern of training and I've watched my weight gradually increase and my fitness decrease. Lisa, I've had both hips done and it's going to be, I'll do my best to answer this question, but uh, you and I are uh, kind of went in different directions. And let me see if I can get some insights here. I realize that I've actually reached that tipping point of get sorted now or it will never happen. Yeah, age 61, it's, uh, <laughs> it's time to go. Um, in terms of returning to Masters Veterans Competitions in Taekwondo uh, or boxing, I just finished the 10,000 Swing Challenge and it did everything it was supposed to do. That's great to hear. Okay, thank you. Now I'm focused on losing 10 kilograms in six months so I can compete in Taekwondo again in an appropriate weight class. So we're looking at, uh, you want to compete again, you'll be sneaking up on 62 when you, and, but you want to lose 10K, okay. I would like to keep doing the swings in addition to my sports specific training. Do you have any recommendations on how to bring this all together? I got two quick, simple ones, okay. First off, you're gonna lose the weight in the kitchen. You're gonna lose the weight in the kitchen. You're gonna lose the weight in the kitchen. 
uh, as we speak right now, um, this is morning where I am and evening where Brian is. Um, but I have a whole pot, a slow cooker, where I have probably 10 different vegetables, um, uh, some ground meat, and some seasoning because I'm making a massive amount of uh, whatever I want to call it, a vegetable stew soup for dinner. Uh, this is where it has to happen. You, um, if you're not intermittent fasting and it's something that appeals to you, uh, Pat Flynn is recommending these 15-minute uh, daily windows of fasting um, followed by a quick 15-minute workout and then a protein shake. Something that simple uh, and that 15-minute that workout for you could be some kettlebell swings uh, in 15 minutes. It'd be, I'm guessing you can go anywhere from 75, perhaps as high as 250 swings. It's a lot of swings, but those swings will tie in well to your Taekwondo. Uh, at every meal, if you could make sure you have, uh, I don't know, eight, 10 vegetables, this might really just be the game changer for you. One other idea I want to bring from my track and field world uh, for you is something we called that was called mixed training back in the 1960s by Peter Sheen, the great German coach. Uh, basically, mixed training is when you combine your sport practice with your strength or practice literally at the same time. So as a thrower, you would uh, uh, do standing throws, kettlebell swings, full turns, kettlebell presses, um, some drills, uh, goblet squats. And so you throw, lift, throw, lift, throw, lift. Just spitballing an idea here. Bring your kettlebell to the studio where you're, where you're doing your fight training. Do some fight training. Do a set of swings. Do some fight training. Do a set of swings. Do some fight training um, with the hip. You should be okay by this now. Some goblet squats, fight train, press. And just keep bouncing back and forth. Uh, I would, uh, you might notice there's less oxygen in the room after these workouts. But I'll tell you one thing, you're going to be fight ready when it comes around. Uh, reminder, fat loss happens in the kitchen. Fast. Think about protein and veggies. Drink more water. Try this mixed training idea. And I do want you to let me know, Lisa, how this is all going, okay? And congratulations on you, too, as I, to, to getting back in the game. Uh, that's, it's inspiring. And thank you for sharing your story. Well, thank you for listening. Remember, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. We're going to be here answering your questions for a long time. Thank you again.